choice that will define the future of a region that served as the cradle of civilization and a crucible of strife. We begin our headlines tonight in Egypt, Israel, Jerusalem, Gaza, Gaza Strip, and the West Bank, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Gulf states. A lion that was rescued from the abandoned zoo in Syria has given birth to a cub just hours after. In the pursuit of a broader peace and peace with the Palestinians, and I greatly look forward to discussing this in detail with you, Mr. President. Hi, my name's Gemma Neary and welcome to this week's edition of the Modern Middle East. Throughout the show we'll look at oil as a key economic resource in the Middle East. We'll be joined by an associate professor who developed an exchange program for Saudi Arabian teachers. And we'll finish with a feature travel story about a lifeguard who backpacked through Oman and Yemen. But first, let's look at what's been happening in the Middle East. We begin our headlines in the Yemeni city of Hadaida tonight, where several airstrikes have hit key civilian infrastructure and left at least 30 people dead and dozens injured. Officials blamed the assault on the Saudi Arabian-led coalition, who have denied involvement and accused Houthi opposition rebels of launching the strikes. One of the missiles struck the entrance to the country's largest hospital, which coincides with the World Health Organization's warning that the country is on the brink of a third cholera epidemic. Weeks of mediated negotiations in Egypt to broker a long-term ceasefire between Israel and Hamas in the Gaza Strip are reportedly on the verge of a breakthrough. The initial commitment would require Hamas to halt Palestinian protesters from flying incendiary kites across the border, in exchange for a significant increase in the transit of goods through a critical border crossing to Gaza. If implemented, the ceasefire could alleviate hostilities, which have erupted into weekly clashes at the border since March. The Israeli military killed seven suspected Islamic State militants after they reportedly crossed from Syria into Israel-occupied territory in the Golan Heights. An airstrike was carried out against the militants after they came within 200 metres of, of an Israeli fence, and an additional search of the area found multiple explosive belts and an AK-47 rifle. Several ISIL militants also attempted to enter into Jordan from Syria, but were forced to retreat after encountering heavy resistance from the Jordanian military. An Egyptian court sentenced 75 people to death, including several leaders of the outlawed Muslim Brotherhood, for their involvement in the violent clashes that followed the overthrow of former President Morsi in 2013. The cases have been referred to the country's highest Islamic legal authority, the Grand Mufti, for a final recommendation. The recent sentencing is part of a mass trial of over 700 people, which human rights organisation Amnesty International previously highlighted doesn't include any members of the security forces that were also involved in the violence. Tens of thousands of protesters have gathered in Tel Aviv to protest Israel's controversial nation-state law. The recent legislation grants Jewish citizens the exclusive right to self-determination in the country and has attracted criticism that it isolates minority groups as second-class citizens. The demonstrations are the largest show of public backlash since the vote and were led by the Druze, a minority sect who have felt particularly outraged due to their unwavering record of loyal contribution to the Israeli government, military and society. The United States imposed sanctions on Turkey after a breakdown in diplomatic negotiations over the country's refusal to release a detained American pastor. The Turkish government arrested the American in 2016, who is facing a potential 35-year sentence for allegations of espionage and association with terrorists. However, the US administration maintains that he's innocent and have been lobbying for his release. The incident has significantly strained relations between the two NATO allies, with Turkey announcing that they plan to implement their own retaliatory sanctions. Iran's Revolutionary Guards Corps carried out a major naval exercise in the Persian Gulf as a dialogue between Iran and the United States continued to deteriorate. US intelligence official, officials estimated that the exercise of over 100 vessels intended to demonstrate Iran's capacity to shut down the Strait of Hormuz, an essential oil trade route. The display comes as President Trump backtracked from recent rhetoric and suggested a meeting with Iranian leadership, 
which was rejected by Iran, who called the president unreliable. Lastly, an innovative marine conservation project was launched off the southern coast of Lebanon. Ten armoured vehicles, including six tanks, were donated by the army and deliberately sunk into the Mediterranean Sea as part of a plan to simultaneously revive the area's marine life and create a unique diving attraction for tourists. The project was initiated by the environmental group The Friends of the Coast of Sidon and is aiming to grow an artificial coral reef to reverse the effects that years of pollution have had on the coastal landscape. Let's move on now to the focus of this week's episode, the changing supply of and demand for Middle Eastern oil. The first oil well in the Middle East was discovered in Iran in 1908. 45 years later, Iranian Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh announced plans to nationalise the country's oil reserves. The move threatened the interests of Western oil companies in the region and prompted British and American intelligence forces to plan and coordinate the overthrow of the democratically elected leader. Crude oil is the most traded commodity in the world. The type that's found in the Middle East has been particularly sought after because it's easy and cheap to extract and refine, unrestricted by environmental legislation and globally central so it can be efficiently exported. Currently, two thirds of oil produced in the Middle East are exported to nations in the Asia Pacific, such as China, Japan and South Korea. The Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries was established in 1960 in an attempt to unify exporting countries and ensure the stabilization of the global oil market. OPEC's 14 member states collectively own 81.5% of the world's proven crude oil reserves, with 65% of these in the Middle Eastern states of Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, the United Arab Emirates and Qatar. Saudi Arabia alone owns a third of the Middle East reserves, making it the world's largest producer of petroleum. The value of the country's oil and gas exports contributed nearly 50% to their GDP in 2017, approximately $339 billion. With the bulk of the world's crude oil supply located in a region that's prone to outbreaks of diplomatic and militarized conflict, periods of instability have the potential to exacerbate the volatility of the global market and significantly disrupt standard trading. During the Yom Kippur War in 1973, the United States increased its support of the Israeli effort to counteract the Soviet Union's decision to provide arms to Egypt and Syria. This prompted a coalition of Arab countries to reduce their oil production and enforce an embargo on exports to the US, creating an international crisis that lasted for almost six months. The global price of a barrel of oil quadrupled from three to $12 and caused a worldwide shortage that resulted in panicked queues at petrol stations and calls for measures that would reduce domestic transportation and household energy consumption. Where it's not just US having access to oil, Saudi Arabia is able to exercise influence to ensure the consistent flow of oil and its price stability. They're the critical elements of it. It's not US control of oil fields. They want stability in pricing and they want consistent flow. In 2016, the global demand for oil averaged 95.12 million barrels per day. The uses of crude oil are endless, with refined petroleum products such as gasoline, diesel and raw materials used to fuel cars and planes, generate electricity and create plastics that form an uncountable number of products used throughout our everyday lives. To meet an increasing demand, an enduring pillar of American foreign policy has been to preserve the uninterrupted flow of oil out of the Persian Gulf. To whoever would listen, I said, keep the oil. Keep the oil, keep the oil. Don't let somebody else get it. However, in an evolving economic market, this reliance on Middle Eastern oil is actually shifting. While a recent poll found that 73% of US citizens believe that the bulk of America's oil is imported from the Middle East, 40% of the country's imports actually come across the border from Canada, and only 17% from states such as Saudi Arabia and Iraq. Due to an Obama-era decrease in foreign imports and increase in domestic production, some estimates suggest that by 2020, the United States will have overtaken Saudi Arabia as the world's largest producer of petroleum. While an abundance of oil launched the Middle East into the global marketplace, without increasing income revenue, the current power structure and social wealth of state in the Persian Gulf 
aren't sustainable. Yeah, you know, diversification in finance and economy, meaning that do not put your eggs in one basket. So GCC countries should uh, diversify the economies from oil sectors and concentrate in other sectors like tourism, construction, high manufacturing. So they will not be hurt by the global oil shock. Past uncertainty in the global market was driven by the assumption that one day the world would either exhaust its oil supplies or the shift to renewable energy sources would cause a rapid decline in demand that would collapse many of the economies in the Middle East. However, recent predictions estimate that oil consumption will eventually peak and then plateau. It's difficult to forecast exactly when industry growth will stagnate, but whether it's in the next decade or in a few to come, it's imperative that Gulf states continue to invest in long-term diversification measures that lay the foundation for a self-sustainable and secure economic future. We have to go to a break, but stick around as Associate Professor Libby Tubbol joins us to discuss an immersive exchange program that's training a group of Saudi Arabian teachers to take on the economic challenges of the 21st century. Welcome back. Joining us in the studio is, is Associate Professor Libby Tubball, who has more than two decades of experience in the education sector, including the development of the Building Leadership for Change through School Immersion Initiative at Monash University, which recently welcomed 25 Saudi Arabian teachers as part of an educational exchange. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, firstly, so tell us a bit about your career and how you became involved with the initiative. Well, I've actually been in teacher education for 25 years but I've been a teacher for over 40 years wow. and Monash is an international university that has many many projects that form partnerships and collaboratives with countries all across the world and Monash has got a long history of being involved with Saudi Arabia yeah. so when the Saudi prince decided that he wanted to send groups of teachers all over the world to learn about innovation and 21st century approaches to teaching and learning, Monash tended for the project. So last year we had 50 for six months and they were an amazing group of teacher leaders, principals, primary teachers, secondary teachers and we had a wonderful time with them and they went back saying we've learned so much but we should be there for longer. <laughs> so this year the project has 24 teachers that we have with us and they're with us for an entire year. So we have much longer to build their learning and to give them opportunities to go into many different schools in Melbourne and in the regional areas as well. Yeah. Uh, tell us a bit about the program itself. Does, what does it entail and what is it aiming to achieve? Well, when they first arrive, our main focus is at, actually on building their English language competency in speaking, writing, listening, and being able to communicate really effectively with the teachers that they're going to mix with in the schools. Most of the group already have fairly basic English skills and while they start that English language course, we have them with us in the Faculty of Education starting to build their understanding of issues on the education agendas here. We take them out to provide them with experiences of quite a few different kinds of schools and we try and work out what their needs are so that the program can then build whatever their particular specialist interest is as teachers. Yeah, it's a huge change to come from Saudi Arabia to Australia for just a year. So how do these specific teachers get involved with the program? Well, they have to express an interest back in Saudi Arabia in coming and ha having a grand adventure really. And they've come on this journey with us because they really want to grow and develop and they want to know about what's innovative, how do you engage young people today, and how can they be better teachers. And I think it's pretty challenging for a lot of us as educators these days because young people are so used to a faster life with lots of access to technology. Definitely. And the ways that teachers are working with young people is changing a lot because of information communication technologies and new approaches to getting kids involved. Yeah. So how did the program develop and how closely did Monash work with the Ministry of Education throughout the process? We worked very closely in the tender process in making sure that we did meet their needs. And what they've done is they've sent 
teachers into not just Melbourne and Australia, but universities all over the world. In, so it's international. In Finland, yeah. in England, in the United States, in Canada, in Scotland. And so we offered a particular program this year for teachers. And our teachers include special needs teachers who work with hearing impaired students, with autistic young people, with uh, special intellectual needs in schooling. We've got experts in science, in robotics, in maths and in and other subject areas as well. So the program is developed a lot around their needs but also based on issues on the education agenda internationally, yeah. like building learner competencies and capabilities in literacy, numeracy, critical and creative thinking. These are, these are big issues yeah. for educators all around the world. Okay, so what started the program to begin with? What kind of economic and educational challenges is Saudi Arabia facing? Well, the Saudi prince wants to ensure that the economy in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is broadening yeah. beyond oil and that the education systems, the health system, the economic, in, economic um, systems in the country in general are right up with global trends. Yeah. And having a highly educated workforce and educating young people for a changing world is at the very centre of innovation and change and that's why the government is committing to these programs all over the world. And how are these challenges addressed throughout the program? So the first thing that we need to do is we need to work out what are these, these teachers currently doing in their schools yeah. that they're proud of and that they're emphasising and are working with their young people. And we're finding that many of our participants in this group are doing extraordinary things. Their students are competing in international robotics competitions, maths olympiads, science and all sorts of other creative pursuits. It's very impressive. It is. One of our, one of our teachers who's with us this year is a, an outstanding art ed educator. But it doesn't matter who you are or what experience you have, going into a completely different context and being immersed in a range of schools and watching the ways that other educators are approaching planning for learning, assessing learning, resourcing learning, doing things in new ways, is always great professional learning. Yeah. And what we're finding with the group this year is that they're just hungry for every opportunity we can provide to stimulate their thinking. That's fantastic. Mm. What would you say the main differences and similarities are between Australian and Saudi systems? I think one of the differences is that there's quite a lot of remote areas in Saudi Arabia that are right out in the desert. A couple of the teachers, when we asked them to explain what was it like in their own context in Saudi Arabia, took us by, via Google Earth into their village, into Bedouin villages right out in the rural areas. And we were all amazed at, we just didn't expect it. And about a third of our participants come from schools where there's 70 or fewer children. Wow. So to come into a situation here where the first school that we took them with had seven or eight hundred students and film studios and music programs that they don't have in Saudi Arabia and access to technologies that not all schools have, this really creates a very different learning environment. So some of the differences are because of the remote locations and some of the differences are because culturally Saudi Arabia is different. Yeah. So all the schools are single sex, for example. Boys or girls are in separate schools. Oh. So for our Saudi teachers to come into our context and to go into co-ed situations is immediately very different for them. And particularly when subjects are taught in different ways. For example, in most of our schools, digital technologies computer use is all integrated across the curriculum. Whereas in some schools in Saudi Arabia, it's a separate subject. But things are changing very rapidly in Saudi Arabia. You, yeah. You've probably heard about women driving and yeah. movie theatres coming in. and it, it, There's a lot of change. I was in Riyadh for a special conference, national conference of educators in April. And you can see that this is almost a weekly occurrence that new initiatives are coming in to society. For some people, maybe a little more rapidly than they'd expected. Yeah. Just mm. before we run out of time, in what way do you hope the program will grow? 
Well, the program is already growing. We're in our second year and we have our teachers involved in a change project. So last year there were 50 different projects that came out of our project in the Faculty of Education at Monash University. This year there will be probably 25 different ones. So the teachers go back to Saudi Arabia as change agents. They go back to their own schools, to their clusters, to cities and towns across Saudi Arabia already with a project that they are so committed to that they want to implement. Yeah. So we're hoping to be engaged with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia over many years because the enthusiasm of the teachers and their hunger to learn and to, to be able to take home the ideas they've developed is very real. Thank you so much for coming on and talking to us. It's been a pleasure. Uh, we have to go to a break but stick around. When we get back we'll share around some tips from an adventurous traveller about the best things to explore in Oman and Yemen. Welcome back. A lot of the content that we cover throughout the show focuses on regional politics and conflict, but we also want to spend a bit of time exploring some of the beautiful destinations and unique experiences that the Middle East has to offer. So to wrap up tonight's episode, we spoke earlier with Stefan, a part-time lifeguard and adventurous travel blogger who recently backpacked his way through Oman and Yemen. Yeah, Yemen, Yemen was an adventure. <laughs> My name's Stefan Gollin. Um, so I suppose you could say I'm a professional travel blogger and photographer. I've been uh, I've had my website for about two years now and backpacking for about 11 years. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't pay all the bills. So uh, what I do when I'm home in Canada is I'm a lifeguard part time. Uh, my last trip I just came back from was Oman and Yemen. One of the the best things I found about Oman is. Um, I, people don't realize how it, it really isn't touristy. Like uh, tourist infrastructure hasn't been developed there. So by traveling through Oman, you, you really rarely run into other tourists. Because it is like a more um, like culturally sensitive country, you, you will want to use stuff like couch surfing to connect with people. Unfortunately, because of that, you have to rent a car if you want to really experience the country. Um, Oman has really uh, beautiful natural scenery. So if you go up to the mountains and the small villages and the wadis, you can go like swimming in perfectly clear blue water in these like oases hidden in mountain valleys. And hiking there was incredible. Oman food, uh, it really is incredible. Um, so they have quite a few different dishes. Uh, one of my favorites, honestly, was one of the most common dishes is actually called mendi. It's just a big plate of uh, spiced rice and then a big hunk of usually camel meat or goat or, and everyone sits around in a circle and eats with their hands. And it's actually, that dish actually comes from Yemen. So <laughs> like Oman was fascinating because it's, it's so um, modern yet traditional at the same time. I didn't expect the, the culture to be so strong in Oman, but it really is. Oman's quite a wealthy, like beautiful country. But Yemen, Yemen's like, it's like stepping back in time. Um, I've actually wanted to go to Yemen for quite some time, but because of obviously current events, um, I didn't think it was quite possible. I contacted a tour company and um, he had been operating uh, with bringing in journalists. So uh, with my website, I uh, was able to say that I was a journalist and I got a, yeah, and I was given approval by the coalition government, uh, which is based in Aden or Aden. And um, so then I crossed from Oman. We stayed with one guy in the old city. In his house, his house, I think he said, was uh, 800 years old. And it's all, yeah, it was all mud and no running water or anything. It was really beautiful. Uh, you have to understand the security situation. It, it's not stable. It is, it is very unstable at the moment. But the biggest thing, like for me, why, why I did so well in Yemen, I, I trusted the right people. I trusted really amazing people. I really like the old city and the capital. Uh, it's just, it's so traditional. And now with the war, there's no, there's no running water or electricity. So it, it really is going back in time. But um, the, the locals in Sana'a and Yemenis in general are so resilient. And they're very proud of who they are. And I, I love that about them. There's, I'm, there's no putting it away around it. Like uh, there are times where I'm scared or there's times where I'm second guessing if I should do it. But this is what I love to do. and. Um, 
Yeah, like I one thing I hate is lots of people say to me is, oh, you have a death wish. No, I, I do a lot of uh, research, a lot of planning. This takes a lot to it, so. Thank you so much to Stefan for sharing his incredible experience and for giving us a rare glimpse of Yemen in particular. As he mentioned, Yemen is unfortunately quite unstable due to the ongoing civil war that's ravaged most of the country. But if you would like more information on travelling to Oman, visit the website below. That's the end of this week's edition. Share your thoughts on anything we covered on our social media pages and head to our YouTube channel to catch up on highlights from tonight and previous episodes. Tune in next week when we look at the art, theatre, music and film industries in the Middle East. I'm Gemini, thanks for watching and have a great night.